In our last episode, we talked about questions of legitimacy in regards to Henry V's claims on the French crown, specifically how one version of the play, the Q1 Henry V, and the first folio differ in that the Q1 lacks a conspiratorial element that's found in the first folio. The consequences are strong because if the church are playing games with Henry, then lives will be at risk. This problem of dying for a cause that may not be legitimate haunts even Henry V in both versions. And Henry's back to his old tricks that we last saw in both Henry IV Part One and Two. He puts on a disguise, pretending he's a common soldier, and he begins to hear soldiers' doubts. He's back in prose, no longer the blank verse he inherited from his father along with the crown. You have to think of the military camp now as East Cheap, with pistol and everybody there. And Henry falls into a dispute with a group of soldiers, the king pretending to be a common soldier. For though I speak it to you, I think the king is but a man as I am. The violet smells to him as it doth to me. The elements shows to him as it doth to me. That's the sky. All his senses have but human conditions. His ceremonies, laid by if you get rid of all of the kingly ceremonies, in his nakedness he appears but a man. And though his affections or desires are higher mounted than ours, yet when they stoop, when they come down, fall down, they stoop the like, they stoop with the like wing. So they, then they kind of soar. It's, it's, a, it's a falcon term. Therefore, when he sees reason of fears as we do, his fears out of doubt be of the same relish as ours are, right? So his fears are just like our fears. Yet in reason, no man should possess him with any appearance of fear, lest he, by showing it, should dishearten his army. His fears, if he showed them publicly, would scare his own troops. They're not buying it. They have doubts. Why are they here in France? Bates. He may not show what outward courage he will, but I believe, as cold a night as this, he could wish himself in Thames up to the neck. And so I would he were, and I by him at all adventures. So we were quit here. In other words, the king wishes he was in, in London at the Thames, and so would I, when none of us would be here. King, by my troth, I will speak my conscience of the king. I think he would not wish himself anywhere but where he is. In other words, here in France, in front of this, about to go to battle. Bates. Then I would he were here alone, so should he be sure to be ransomed and a many poor men's lives saved. I mean, I'd rather him just be captured and then at least none of us would die. King, I dare say you love him not so ill to wish him here alone, whosoever you speak this to feel other men's minds. Methinks I could not die anywhere so contented as in the king's company, his cause being just and his quarrel honorable. That's more than we know. Bates will speak on behalf of being a king's subject, but Williams will raise further doubts. Bates comes to the rescue. I or more than we should seek after, for we know enough if we know we are the king's subjects. If his cause be wrong, our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us. In other words, if Henry's cause is a crime, the fact that they're just obedient to Henry V as king wipes away any criminality. Williams. But if the cause be not good, the king himself had a heavy reckoning to make when all of those legs and arms and heads chopped off in a battle shall join together at the latter days and cry all, we died at such a place. To which the king gets very defensive. You can't blame me or him. So if a son that is by his father sent about merchandise 
do sinfully miscarry upon the sea. So in other words, if a son is sent by the father to be a merchant out and do some trading, and he do sinfully miscarry upon the sea, does, does sinful things, the imputation or blame of his wickedness by your rule should be imposed upon his father that sent him. Or if a servant under his master's command transporting a sum of money be assailed by robbers and die in many irreconciled iniquities or sins, you may call the business of the master the author of the servant's damnation. In other words, if the servant dies in sin, are you going to blame the master who sent the servant out if the servant goes to hell for his sins? But this is not so. The king is not bound to answer the particular endings of his soldiers, the father of his sons, nor the master of his servant, for they purpose not their death when they purpose their services. Besides, there's no king, be his, be his cause never so spotless. If it comes to the arbitrant of swords, can try it out with all unspotted soldiers. This is a theological answer. It doesn't justify the political causes of their deaths. Nevertheless, Bates comes to his defense. I do not desire he should answer for me, and yet I determined to fight lustily for him. King, I myself heard the king say he would not be ransomed. Aye, uh, he said so to make us fight cheerfully. But when our throats are cut, he may be ransomed and we never the wiser. The scene ends with an exchange of gauges, the same sort of scene we saw in both its serious form at the beginning of Richard II and its comical form at the end of Richard II. Now, all this skepticism raises doubts about the legitimacy of Henry's claims for the French crown. Bates' remarks about prisoners and a king's ransom also points to later disturbing elements in this war associated with prisoners. Agincourt is famous for its prisoners, including the famous poet Charles of Orleans, who is a character. The medieval chronicles and even this source of Henry V always highlight how many French nobles were captured and killed. And Shakespeare, naturally following Hollinshed, does likewise. What prisoners of good sort are taken, uncle? Exeter, Charles, Duke of Orleans, nephew to the king, John, Duke of Bourbon, and Lord Abosico, of other lords and barons, knights, and squires, full 1,500, besides common men. We already talked about prisoners and their ransoms in medieval warfare when talking about Hotspur in Henry IV, Part One. We also get a funny scene with Ancient Pistol. This is, of course, Hostess Quickly's new loving husband. Remember how much she hated him in Henry IV, Part Two. He and the Welshman, Captain Flolan, are now the new comical stars since Falstaff now is dead. In Henry V, he captures a French prisoner in the Battle of Agincourt. And it's funny because he doesn't know French. Now, Henry V, in many ways, revels in political and cultural clashes. Not just the funny scenes with Catherine, who doesn't speak a word of English and is trying to learn English or trying to communicate with Henry V, but also the French lords. They're always passionate. They're vain. They're not sober like the English. And they joke and they brag. For example, the Dauphin sends Henry tennis balls to remind him of his unserious life. They're so confident they even place a wager over the battle. Rambour. Who will go to hazard with me for 20 prisoners who wants to gamble? Constable, you must first go yourself to hazard, air before you have them. Rambour wants to make a bet based on future earnings, prisoners and their ransoms. But we won't see the taking of any English prisoners. Orleans and Bourbon will become prisoners, while the constable 
and Rambur, our man who wants to make the wager, will be dead. The audience knows this. So Pistol and his taking of a French prisoner is funny because he doesn't understand him. Pistol is looking for prisoners of quality, capable of paying out ransoms. Pistol, art thou a gentleman? He's talking to the prisoner. What is thy name? Discuss. Now the French soldier is scared, and so he exclaims, Oh, Seigneur Dieu, oh, Lord God. Pistol, oh, Seigneur Dieu should be a gentleman. Perpend my words, weigh my words. Oh, Seigneur Dieu, and mark, oh, Seigneur Dieu, thou diest on point of fox. That's a kind of sword. Except, oh, Seigneur, thou do give to me egregious ransom. It's funny. You don't have to know French to know that Captain Pistol doesn't speak a word. But the Frenchman doesn't understand his captor either. He even mistakes this bellowing windbag as a lord. Pistol, bid him prepare, for I will cut his throat. Que dit-il, monsieur? says the French soldier scared. What did he say? The boy, il me commande à vous dire que vous faites vous prêt. He's told, he's commanded me to tell you that you should prepare yourself, car ce soldier, soldat ici est disposé tout à cette heure de couper votre gorge. This soldier here is ready to cut your throat. Couper votre gorge. Oi! Coupel gorge, père ma foi. I'm speaking a little French now. Peasant, unless thou give me crowns, brave crowns, those are coins, or mangled shall thou be by this my sword. But the boy, this is remember is Falstaff's page, disparages Pistol's valor to us. The boy page then tells us in his little soliloquy that unlike ancient Pistol, Bardoff and Nim were truly brave, but they were hung. And then he says he's going to head back to the camp. The boy after Pistol's decided he will take the prisoner, he gives you upon his knees a thousand thanks and he esteems himself happy that he hath fallen into the hands of one as he thinks the most brave, valorous, and thrice worthy seigneur of England. As I suck blood, I will some mercy show. Follow me, boy to the French prisoner now. Suivez-vous le grand capitaine. And then as they leave, the boy says, I did never know so full a voice issue from so empty a heart. But the saying is true. The empty vessel makes the greatest sound, right? Because you blow into it, it makes a huge sound. Bardoff and Nim had 10 times more valor than this roaring devil in the old play. That's an allusion to the morality plays, just like with Falstaff. That everyone may pare his nails with a wooden dagger. And they're both hanged, and so would this be if he durst steal anything adventurously. I must stay with the lackeys with the luggage of our camp. Why is this terrible? Because Falstaff's little page, like Falstaff and Bardoff and everyone else associated with East Cheap, is going to go to his death because of Henry V's actions. And in the next episode, we're going to look at the end of East Cheap. Alright guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell.